people of Earth. We have come to upgrade your cosmic consciousness. DNA activation ready in three, two, one. Hi, welcome to Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. I'm Craig Anderson. And I'm Lou Quinto. Lou, got a great interview coming up today. Something a little different. Somebody, I know, I, I, I saw my homework and yes, this is a little bit different. Somebody way more famous than us too. I, I, actually, I'm a little, I'm intimidated. And I don't say that very often because right. our guest coming up is he's very used to being in front of the microphone in front of a tv camera and so uh and i gotta make sure that we have our our best faces and voices on (laughs) yes we are without bearing the lead we are about to be joined by peter dunn pete the planner and we have talked a lot about how you know employees can be assisted during all these difficult times through the pandemic and different things that we've been going through And we're really talking to Pete about how people's personal financial struggles can impact how they're doing at work and what you can do about it as a business owner or a leader. So it's a lot to help you better understand what's going on with your team, help you to better serve your team, which ultimately is going to give you a better team, more culture, more engagement. And we're really- He's not not giving us financial advice, right? He is not giving us (laughs) financial advice. We'll we'll work on that off camera with him (laughs) Okay. Uh, but let's go ahead and bring him on, Pete the Planner. Pete, welcome to Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. Lou and I are excited to have you with us today to talk about how we can help employees be more successful. So we just had some introductions. Lou, how would you like to jump in? We, we do need to uh, give a little bit of an introduction, Pete. Pete is the CEO of Your Money Line. Uh, he is a podcast host. He is a lot of different things and uh, somebody that I've known for several years. So we're really excited to have you here, Pete. It's good to be with you. I'm excited to be here with you. I have to note though, we are gonna talk about the employee experience and what employers try to do to help employees. And so while I am an expert in the finances of people's employees, like any other business leader, I'm still learning to be a good leader within my business. So some of the answers I'm gonna give today, I don't want people to think that I'm an expert at being a boss. (laughs) <laughs> but I am an expert about the money of employees, if that makes sense. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't think there's anyone, though, Pete, that is the expert on being a boss. Uh, I think bosses, you, you've had, you can have a great boss in a, in a wrong situation, and people will tell you he was a horrible boss or she was a horrible boss. And then you get a boss in another situation who they're a great boss. And so, yeah, I, I think we're all learning and I like your, I like your philosophy. I always have the philosophy. I want to have one foot in the grave and still learning. So (laughs) Craig and I on this podcast always tell people we do a lot of research, but there are a lot of experts out there. We're providing our advice based upon our research. So, uh, but you, you're going to teach us, I hope something when it comes to broadcasting, I mean, you've got the podcasting, but you also have the radio background too on WIBC where you had your own show. And so you're used to being in front of this thing that we call a microphone. And, uh, so I'm going to be watching you extra special, not about being a boss, Pete, but being a broadcaster. Well, I, I'll dazzle you with my broadcasting skills and hopefully distract you away from my subpar guidance on being a boss. <laughs> well, and, 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 and I do like the fact that uh, we, I didn't, I mean, I, I dressed before I started the podcast with you, but I'm already wearing black. So you and I do have that in common already. So no, it's, it's great. Yeah, Craig did not get the memo and had yeah, he no. gotten it anyway, he still would have worn a blue blazer. So. Yes, that's right. Because I am a rebel and a former banker. So yes. I or, or, or a Captain America t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> that's under the button down shirt. Yeah, it's under the button down. Yeah. Okay. But, All right. Well, well, Pete, we want to talk to you about being a boss. These have been some trying times over the last few years for anybody. Uh, even I think if Jack Welsh or some of the, the big, the Lee Iacocas came, you know, were alive during the last two years, we would have seen them knock down a few pegs. What can I ask, have, have you deliberately changed in your leadership of your firm? Uh, I have to admit, what I'm, the answer I'm going to give you is, is really tight. <laughs> and the reason it's really tight is because I, I talk about this a lot. So it seems like I've thought about this too much, but 
prior to the pandemic, I think many of us subscribe to this idea of work-life balance. I'm sure on the show, you talk about it quite a bit. And, and I talked about it a lot. And I just made this switch early in the pandemic to calling it life work balance. And for me, that set the tone of what this was all about is that so many people were put in these involuntarily horrible situations and all they could do was survive. All they could do is to try to catch a wink of sleep before they woke up the next morning and then doom scrolled for another couple hours to everything what was going on. And so uh, what we decided to do as a leadership team is to say, life first, work second, and the business will survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just need people to get to the other side of this situation. Now, that being said, I didn't think we'd have a season three of the pandemic <laughs> like we're in right now. Uh, but I think we tried to become a lot more reasonable as it relates to life uh, right. dictating what happens instead of work. Yeah. 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 It, it, and, and one of those things I'm sure that you will readily, uh, you know, endorse is being more empathetic. Uh, and we've talked uh, on several occasions, Craig and I, with other guests, where empathy for a long time was not part of that management training that you learned at university. It was something that hopefully you learned when you got to the job, but even then it was a back burner issue. And over the last two years, it, empathy has really come to the forefront. Uh, you, you know, you've got Simon Sinek, you know, in his book, uh, Leaders uh, Eat Last. Uh, and the, we, we hear terms of servant leadership now that we really, prior to March of 2020, we didn't hear a lot of. It was almost like fringe management uh, teachings. And now it's mainstream teachings. And it goes back to that work-life balance that you've talked about, because also prior to March of 2020, we gave a lot of lip service, let's face it, to work-life balance, okay? We want you to have a life, but you got to make sure that job is done. And unfortunately, as we know, there are people who they gave up on their life and put more toward the business side of it. Yeah, I, I think my turning point in terms of empathy was I was at my my son's youth basketball game a few years ago, and there was a kid on the other team who was, well, when I was growing up, the kid would be described as a bad kid. Like he was sort of a dirty player. He was a, a you know, six-year-old ne'er-do-well, if you will. And I'm watching this occur, and my natural instinct was like, man, that kid's sort of a jerk. And then it hit me like a bolt of lightning, like – he's six, Peter, like he's a six-year-old. I feel sorry yeah. for the situation that he's been put in. And so to me, it was like this breakthrough of empathy of like, I don't have to demonize a six-year-old kid who's having some behavior issues. I feel bad that, that this is his circumstance. And I'm not kidding. I went home that day and I started looking through different areas of my life professionally. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, I tend to compartmentalize people into good and right. bad for whatever reason. And so when I made that switch, it became a lot more helpful as a leader within my organization. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, it, that, that's one of, uh, I mean, that's one of us when it comes to human nature is it's always observe and based on our experience, we react. And that's exactly what you did. You observed and you reacted based upon your experiences. And then you had an epiphany, if I can call it that, where you go back and look and say, you know what? I haven't been reacting the right way. And I think a lot of leaders during the last two years have come to that same conclusion, uh, but not with six-year-olds, <laughs> with people who actually had responsibility for them and their business. So, yeah, well, I mean, to the other side of that too, is that when I, who knows how I was when I was six, but I'll note this, I had a, a two parent household that was very loving and supporting upper yeah. middle class background. So, I, I mean, I had every conceivable privilege uh, as a six year old. And so that was the other side of this. And that really brings the financial side of what we do as an organization into this is that not everyone has been born on third base. Um, right. And, and so when you start to look at some of the struggle people go through or will go through and you think, okay, well, if I were in their shoes, and then you realize that you have to extend it beyond that. You yeah. have to say, if I was raised in the same circumstances, another part of this for me was when I was a wealth manager, I used to manage professional athletes money. I used to work with a lot of NFL players. And 
and, and people love to make fun of the financial realities of professional athletes. I mean, it's, there's, there's documentaries about how ridiculous it is. But the reality is, if you had the, a similar upbringing, a similar focus on what was important, and then you get 17 paychecks a year, 17 weeks in a row, and then you don't get paid for 35 weeks in a row, and you have to have it make sense, you couldn't do it either, right? And so yeah. in our financial world, we, we have the wealthy and then the people who aren't wealthy, and we think those are the two groups. It couldn't be any further from the truth. It's just a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's such a good transition into some of these financial things that we, we want to talk to you about, Pete. You know, I was for a long time in sales roles in the bank, and I hung out with other salespeople and clients that we were selling to, all similarly situated people. And then when, when you and I first started talking about some of these things, I had a business that was a call center business, and we were finding all kinds of things that, you know, I don't really have a experience with, right? I can't get to work because I don't have a car. My car broke down and I can't pay for the repair for six weeks or all the, you know, child. And it's where you and I started talking about, you know, how do we help these people? And we'll jump into some of the things you do there. But as we've gone through the last few years, what are, what have been the financial realities for the average employee at all these companies and how is it impacting them right now? Well, I, I would say it has disproportionately affected women uh, over the last couple of years uh, financially and, and career wise. And we've certainly seen that it, we, we saw a study in our, our, our parts a couple of weeks ago that said, most of these coaching services, like we have a, a financial coaching service, if you will, or employees can call us and get help with their financial lives and their employer pays for it. The, the survey said that mostly men call these lines. That has not been our experience. Most of the people that call us are women. And so th that is to suggest what we have seen is you've seen people tasked with not only doing their job, but educating their children as a teacher in, in a virtual classroom. You, you get, uh, you know, sort of change in family dynamics. You, you see all sorts of disruptive behaviors. At the very beginning parts of the pandemic, our team was just dealing with the darkest, worst financial stories you could possibly imagine. The first few months during the pandemic, taking phone calls. I, I'm the CEO of this place. I was jumping on the phone and, and taking some of these calls. And it was rough. It, and, and the reality was at the time, None of us knew what the end of this thing looked like. Not that we know what the end of this thing looks like now, but we certainly right. didn't know in May of 2020. And so, Craig, what I would note is that uh, this whole financial menagerie we are, are all a part of is really about stability. It's not about wealth. It's not about thriving. It's about stability. And so we, we chose to identify 10 factors of stability and, and said, all right, how stable is this person? And how stable is this person? And what does that stability tell us about their productivity? What does it tell us about their, their willingness to resign and go get another job? And so everything we do now is through the lens of stability. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and so true. And that's, that's a lot of what we found with our team was it was their life was so different from kind of the management team. So we didn't even think of the potential things that they were dealing with from time to time. And a lot of it was just stability issues be, and, you know, they were call center people. We weren't paying them six figures a year, right? So it just didn't take much to completely disrupt their life. And stability is actually a really good way to, that may have to be my word for the year next year. Liz. That was my word last year, Craig. So <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm one up on you on that one. So. Well, I, I, yeah, it's, I would note that when you're not stable financially, most of your financial decisions are driven by stress. Okay, so, you know, which, you know what, guys? That's a good thing. It's an animalistic sort of like survival. It's like, I'm stressed. I got to figure it out. But at some point that dynamic breaks down and it's unhealthy to have stress yeah. constantly drive your financial decisions. Now, if you have a lot of stability, like you really do, then you're, what you're allowed to do is to make your financial decisions based on opportunity. You, you see something that you can go for. And so you go for it. Now I'll note the most dangerous place is neither unstable or stable, it's the space in between. That's about 55 to 60% of Americans who are not struggling, but they're also not stable. Right. And this is the world that, that our organization lives in. It's like, how do you take these people who might feel fine? I think I'm okay, but they aren't. And Craig, it, 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 the spectrum is from people making 15 bucks an hour 
to someone making $150,000 an hour can still be in the spectrum of not uh, struggling, but not stable. And, and that's what's so fascinating about this. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, I, I want to go back to something that you brought up that wasn't in my initial considerations before we start the podcast, but you brought it up and, and I want to dive into it further. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you didn't mention you, you reported and we all know it that the last two years has been hardest on women. Do you believe from a business standpoint that the traditional boys club management finally realizes the disadvantage? I, I don't even know if I want to use that word disadvantage difference between a man and a woman when it comes to working, because as you said, uh, and we all know that it, this was a she session, they call it, because women put their life on the sideline in many instances, if they were in a two in a two family household and they did the schooling, the Zoom school with the kids. They were the ones that took the extra time off from work. But e even with not thinking about just the pandemic, women give birth. Men don't give birth. There is physical changes that go on. There is, uh, you know, if you think about going to the hospital after you have hip surgery, there's rehabilitation. And our society really doesn't provide, particularly in the corporate world, that rehabilitation time for a woman without her fearing that she would lose her job or not be able to go back to the same position she was in, where men don't, we, we've never really acknowledged it to the point where we acted. We may have known that it's been going on, but we didn't do anything. Do you see in the future that that is definitely going to be changing in, in our corporations and management? Well, I, I, I want to, of course, here's my disclaimer for this section. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an expert at this, but I have an opinion. Like I, I my opinion is uh, it, the boys, the old boys club has not changed in that regard, right? right. It, it has not because it's still called the old boys club, right? Like yeah. by, by the, by the nature of the fact that we know that, that a big bulk of, of men who have felt the way they felt their opinions have not changed over this. I think there are more men who are more willing to acknowledge the reality of this she session, as right. you call it, Lou. Yeah. Um, but but we'll see. Uh, I mean, all you can hope um, is that your organization is led by people that have a reasonable sensibility about topics like this. I, I would I would say, uh, if we're looking for silver linings of this pandemic. I think the increased focus on mental health is amazing, right? Yep. I, I think if, if nothing else comes of this, this idea that we're allowed to talk about not being okay, I think that's great. Um, I'm not so sure it tightens the wealth gap and the income gap between men and women, although I'd like that to be the case, but I do think that the mental health aspects of things are a silver lining. Okay, all right. I appreciate the opinion. <laughs> it's just an opinion. And it, look, it's an uneducated opinion, but no, I don't. No, there's some, that, that, come on, Pete, you know? don't underestimate yourself there. There, you, you definitely have, there, there's some foundation in, in your opinion that you, that you just set forth. So, and that's what I was looking for. And I appreciate that. Possibly. <laughs> Boy, he won't take a compliment. Will he? Great. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up in Speedway, Indiana. You, you, you just, you just, you're like, ah, yeah, see, see, and I guess my problem is I grew up in New Jersey and we can't get enough compliments. <laughs> well, that's why it takes all of us. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny you mentioned, you know, the, the mental health aspect. We were just interviewing a, another person before, before this session. And one of the things they had done was increase their EAP program to provide more mental health services for their employees because of what they were going through. Um, which we won't say this is a mental health service, but I think it's a good segue to what you're doing with your money line own, well, in many ways. But one of the things that I have talked about is through great resignation and all this turnover and change, you know, not every company can afford to give, what was that guy out West who just bumped everybody's salary to $75,000 a year, right? We can't all do that as business owners, but we can offer different services to help support our employees. So when you were putting together the idea of your money line, what was sitting behind that? What was the genesis of that idea 
and the, the need it met. Thank you for asking me that because it's my favorite question to answer. Um, <laughs> so my, my favorite person to walk this earth uh, in my lifetime was my grandfather, uh, Grandpa Dunn. He worked uh, at General Motors from 1952 to 1983 prior to retiring. So he met my grandma there. They had eight kids. There's so many grandkids and great grandkids, but he was retired uh, for 31 uh, years on top of that, right? So General Motors paid him for 62 years during his lifetime before he passed away in 2014. And they paid a pension to my grandma for seven years before she passed away last year. And the reality is he was not financially perfect, but he had a reasonable retirement because he had a pension. In 1975, 88% of people in the private sector had a pension. Today, it's like 10%. So Craig, the reason why this matters to me is because yes, Grandpa Dunn was imperfect financially, but the fact that he had a pension was the ultimate get out of jail free card. That get out of jail free card does not exist anymore. If a person has day-to-day -day financial challenges, or let's say they're bad with money, it not only affects their ability to retire, but it negatively impacts the business that employs them because those people will not leave in a natural employment cycle. That's a really expensive problem. So the reason we do this is because most Americans aren't going to successfully retire because all of a sudden they have a lot of money. I mean, the math doesn't support that. Their chance at retirement is because they won't need a lot of money. And so that's what we do is we, we get roadblocks out of the way. We make sure that people don't just steamroll and gather obligations throughout their career that they can never unwind. And so you know, it's a, how do you, how do you solve a problem? Do you do on the supply side of money? No, we do it on the demand for money. And we make sure that people aren't creating these lifestyles that are unsustainable. So that's why we're a little bit different in the financial industry than a lot of places. Got it. And, and when you're doing that, what, what do the employers see? Right. And I know when, when we used it at my old business, right, there was a lot less stress and, you know, the employees felt like we actually, you know, cared about some aspect other than just how many calls they could answer in a day. But where, where do you see that impact on the company? Well, there's, there's two quantifiable, met, three that, that actually matter. One doesn't apply to everyone because it's in the nonprofit space, okay? So let's maybe start there. Uh, we do work with a lot of school systems, primarily because we have a tool within our, our toolbox. I don't know. Anyway, my marketing people are probably currently angry at me for saying I have a tool within my toolbox. But alas, <laughs> we have a tool within our toolbox that helps us get student loans forgiven for people who are in public service. For example, we have a school district we've been working with for seven months, and we've gotten $1.9 million of student loans on track to forgiveness. And for just two teachers, we got $280,000 of student loans uh, on track to forgiveness. So that is to say for two people, we have helped shift their net worth by $280,000. So that's to say we have removed major roadblocks and barriers to them having a happy, healthy, productive financial life. So that's one component. Number two, you just simply look at stress and productivity. Uh, I will speak for myself. You are both two accomplished gentlemen that probably don't deal with this at all, but financial stress is awful. I hate it. It's still the worst thing uh, other than a generic Reese's peanut butter egg. You know, sometimes like a company will try to, to remanufacture a Reese's peanut butter egg. They cannot get the formula right. That is a bad thing. But financial stress is next on the list. And it, it is sapping. It will ruin your time. And so that's to say when people are financially stressed, they, they on average suffer three hours of productivity loss per week or 150,000 work hours a year. And so by measuring a person's stability and matching that up with their stress and matching up with their wage and productivity, we can decrease the cost of stress-related productivity loss. And finally, after the longest answer in the history of your podcast, the third topic, the third way, and this one actually really, really is quantifiable, not that the other two weren't, <laughs> is that when a person wants to retire but can't retire, and they are at retirement age, it costs their employer an additional $50,000 a year in increased compensation and benefits for every year that person doesn't retire. We have a client that has 1,500 employees over the age of 70. That's $75 million a year of increased compensation and benefits that if we're able to get those people to gracefully and appropriately retire, 
that that company doesn't have to deal with those costs. So right. it is a very real business loss case that we saw. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you're, you've got all the financial statistics and history, Peter. But I, I think from middle of 1980 to probably the Great Recession, that's when we lost a lot of that security or safety net that people had for retirement. That's when it started to, to get chipped away at and it dwindled down. And my question to you is going to be, um, is retirement going to be a word of the past? Well, it's funny you mentioned that, Lou. Uh, retirement's 90 years old. That's it. I mean, prior to the 19th. Okay, that, 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 yeah. that's most of Congress now that we're talking about. <laughs> Or at least most of the Senate senators and Senate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, prior to that, you worked and then you were dead. Like, if you didn't show up right. to work, people were like, ah, Gary's dead. I mean, yeah. everyone just knew. And yeah, so, he retired three months ago. Now he's yeah. dead. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> so this period of time in which you're not dead and not working is all that has changed in the last 90 years. It's just sort right. of grown. Mm -hmm. um, you're right in the sense that it, we're in this redefinition period. But yeah. there's some really hairy factors here. You're talking about healthcare costs. Yeah. But you're also talking about increased longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're also talking about the decrease of pensions, yep. the increase of housing prices, the increase of college education. So like, it is a nasty formula of, uh-oh. <laughs> it's a nasty formula of, uh-oh. Um, so, you know, that's the dynamic of this situation is that, uh, your retirement will not be like your grandparents' retirement. I talk about Grandpa Dunn's retirement all the time. Mine could not be any more different than what his was. And right. I don't even know what mine's going to look like yet. Yeah. Well, I've always told people that I'm going to be working to, and then the next day they're going to be burying me. So, but it's not, it, it's not just finance. It's also, I love what I do. And, yeah. and for a lot of people, and you probably know this as, as, as well as anybody, sometimes those people retired and died three months later because they felt they didn't belong anymore. There was a loss that they couldn't get over and things went downhill because they didn't retire at 75 or 80 years old. They retired at 62, 63 and then boom, they're gone. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about that, like this idea of, of your self-worth. And if your self-worth is either tied up in your net worth or your work life too much, then those 168 hours a week that we all get assigned every week, we don't know what to do with that time. And it's not right. a fulfilling period of time. So, Lou, that's, that is an absolute big part of this is how people see themselves in their post-work years. Yeah, yeah. No, because I, I remember when my father, he worked for General Motors as well. And he punched a clock in New Jersey and he took a buyout and he and mom went to Sunset Beach, North Carolina, and they built a house and they retired there. And he would tell me all these people would come into the community and, you know, they, they, they oh, I'm just going to play golf the rest of my life. And he, he would tell me that you know, three weeks, three months into it, you know, so-and-so is now a ranger over at another golf course because he needed a job. He, he, he needed that self-worth. Or in the other instances, my father used to say, or it could have been, and he didn't tell us, he just didn't like being around his wife as much as he was now. And sh or she didn't like being around him and said, you need to get out of the house and get a job. Uh, yeah. And, and so, th so there, there was that period or is that period after retirement where people have to rediscover. We, we think it's a great thing. I can wake up every morning and do whatever I want. And, but then after a while that gets old. So yeah. are we going to go from full retirement to a semi-retirement where someone like when you get of the age or Craig and I are of the age where we want to be almost um, uh, like Robert De Niro in that movie, the senior intern, the, the, you know, where he, where he's an executive that goes back and he puts in his time to coach and mentor younger executives and almost in a semi-retirement. Do you see programs like that, that may help fill that gap a little bit? Potentially. I, I do think there has to be a redefinition of what it is to be, we'll call it 
financially independent as opposed to retirement. And retirement yep. mean, means to go away. I think <laughs> what we're talking about is not going away. Right. Uh, we're talking about it's just redefining your income stability and your source of income. So yeah, I, I mean, we're in a retirement crisis, not to, not to turn the, the tables to make this a super dark topic here, but we're in the midst of a massive retirement crisis. So something's got to change. And I, yeah. I think it's going to be how we view uh, financial independence. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. And lest we get accused in the comments of just talking about rich people problems and <laughs> getting bored in retirement, like has happened, um, shift over a little bit to what can we do for those people who are going to struggle to retire, not because they're not bored, but because they just can't because they've come up and we've heard all these reasons, right? This isn't just people without a college degree. This is, you know, with the student loan debt and the deferrals and buying houses and all those expenses that exist today that didn't, what can we do? What can our audience of employers do to help prepare employees better? I mean, just beat on them until they finish up the match up their 401k or is that where it all ends? Well, I always like, you know, having been in this industry for over 20 years, I always like the, hey, put more in your 401k. And then the people say, we can't afford to. And then the employer, or the 401k guy goes, you can't afford not to. And then everyone just <laughs> looks angrily at each other. Um, you know, I think this really plays into what, what you all do on a regular basis, you two gentlemen. And just think about this idea of what is it to build a good culture and what is it to have good employee engagement? Like, I think this is the ultimate connector here, financial wellness. And, and here's why. The, we ask people to care about our business goals and we call that employee engagement, right? We're like, we have big hairy goals. We need you to care about them. So some people can get their bonuses, like, oh, like, you know, that sort of thing. But I think you accomplish that by caring about your workers' goals. I think by engaging into what matters to them when they're not at work in an, in an appropriate and respectful way, you engage with them, they engage with you. And that is reciprocal. This idea of you have to care about these numbers of this company for the shareholders is sort of a ridiculous antiquated idea. And so I think acknowledging that we are all trying to become more resourceful with the resources we have is a good start. Good. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. One last thing. I, I was reading an article, Peter, in the Financial Times, uh, I think about two weeks ago, beginning of the month, and they were talking about the Great Recession and and that they were talking about incentives that they were trying to use, uh, companies were trying to use to keep employees uh, around longer and to attract them. And one of the things that they found is that uh, companies were offering immediate participation in 401ks. And then on the other end, though, they were playing around with the vesting schedule so that they could maintain them for a longer period of time before they saw those matching gifts. It, it, you're shaking your, for our listeners, Peter's shaking his head already, which means that he's, I'm not going to like this answer, but is that something you're finding companies are doing to prevent employees from leaving and getting employees to get to join and stay longer? God, I hope not. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, a 401k is, is a, is a great underutilized, misutilized tool but using it as a way to hang something over someone's head and then they get your matching contributions if you stay long enough, right. I find it be so insincere in, in such a violation of a professional relationship. Our vesting schedule here is once we make a contribution to your account, it's yours. Like we're not, we're not clawing it back. You don't have to stick around. Uh, it's, Lou, it's, I'm laughing and I'm shaking my head because we talked about this on my radio show this past week. And it drives me crazy. And the weird thing is I, I'm sort of on the, 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 you know, the, the just slight outside of the 401k world. So I know I anger a lot of friends and colleagues when I say this, but <laughs> I think a vesting schedule, especially an aggressive one where it's like, oh, six years. And then these matching funds are yours. Right. I, I, it's a violation of trust. Right. Well, I, I mean, we can go back and say the same thing about healthcare. I mean, we're, you know, the only industrial country in the world where in many employees stick around because that's where they can get their health care. 
and they can get it cheap. And I mean, I know, and I'm sure you know of, of people that are with jobs that if it weren't for my health care, I would have been gone 10 years ago. Yeah. What's funny is we, you know, we're a small organization, you know, we're less than 20 people. We just added health care. Like we didn't have to, but we right. did because it just, it finally, I could not justify not doing it anymore. It just didn't sure. feel right. I am out there talking about trying to do the right thing. I was like, we got to do that. We have to absolutely do this because what I didn't want to happen, Lou, is the opposite of what you just said is that people stick around this place because they like it, despite the fact that we don't have things like healthcare, right? right? And so we had to remove that, that, that subtraction from the equation, if you will, yeah. and, and try to become a better place to work. Yeah. Well, when you talk about financial security, uh, let's face it, healthcare costs, uh, are a major part for particularly people who have pre-existing conditions or family members who have pre pre-existing conditions, F their financial stability is off the rail, uh, because you don't know. Yeah. You, you look at a service like GoFundMe or any of those fundraising platforms that they've basically yeah. just turned into like healthcare, uh, you know, expense mitigation services. And it's, it's yeah. a sad commentary. It's a reality. So it's not like you know, we can dismiss it, but it, right. you know, if you get cancer, your financial life takes a horrible turn, which doesn't quite seem fair. It's less fair than the cancer itself in some cases. Right. You're, you are absolutely right. And that is the topic for another podcast. So great last question. Oh, you got one last question talking okay. about horrible financial things oh, that good. happen. And this is a little bit of a light soft I, I don't follow baseball i think it's like a low-hanging curveball that's easy to hit i don't really know i could never hit anything in baseball okay but, first of all uh, that analogy was horrible also so but go ahead <laughs> monday um student loans i came out of the student loan world pete and i have bantered on occasion about student loans we have a whole group of people who have student loans suddenly entering repayment that they haven't had to make a payment on in two plus years pete what do we need to be doing so we don't, as employers, have to just move directly into wage garnishment on these student loans? I think 2022 is going to be one of the weirdest personal finance years ever. 2020 was a great personal finance year. People were so terrified they made good decisions. 2021, there was a lot of pent-up consumer demand and people spent money and the economy was on the rails, uh, despite the fact that supply chain was in trouble. 2022, though, advanced child tax credits gone. First time in 26 months, people have to make student loan payments. $12,800 worth of average stimulus for a family of four is no longer there based on what had gone on from a government support standpoint. If you're an employer right now, May is a magical month because that's when people are going to start owing their student loans back. If you've got an educated workforce where people have student loan payments, be on the lookout because it's going to get weird from, from May to September until people get used to this again, because they found a lot of other obligations and habits to fill uh, their life up with, with what their student loan payments used to do. So Craig, I know you said, let's, let's end on a light note. I don't know how <laughs> setting me up on that question is. I mean, what, what, what else do you want to talk about? Can, 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 talk can about? I just sit, can, I just want to sit here and see you guys go back and forth on this one. <laughs> no, you don't. Craig you knows really don't. The student loan situation is, I, I mean, I, this can only go down from here. So Craig, thanks for that light, easy softball of a question that got all of our spirits lifted. But you have a workshop coming up. We do have a workshop. That was the softball part. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> that was the setup. Thanks for bringing that up. I mean, despite the fact that we got there with a really dark uh, sort of dissertation on student loans, March 10th, we are going to talk about uh, how the recession has impacted people's finances and, and what you need to know since 2022 is going to be such a weird year. It's a, it's a free online event, as we like to say. So please, uh, please join us. Okay. Excellent. Right. And uh, you, if you provide us uh, the information where people can sign up, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll drop it in on the podcast and, and both uh, also in the uh, uh, YouTube version as well. So the good news is I will just gotten back from a business trip to New Orleans. So I will weigh 70 pounds more during that event and be reeking of garlic and Cajun spices. Yeah. There's there's hey. Being Italian, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Reeking of garlic, it's an occupational hazard for my family. <laughs>
So, so, so Pete, how can people get a hold of you and your company when they're not signing up for your workshop? That's yourmoneyline.com. Yourmoneyline.com. You can, of Perfect. course, uh, email me if you like. Pete at yourmoneyline.com. We'd be glad to, to take a look, so they say. All right. Lou, what is your key takeaway today? Uh, my key takeaway is that uh, 2020 is going to be a very rough year when it comes to finances uh, for people. Uh, Pete has piqued my curiosity, uh, particularly with all the things that people are going to have to adjust to uh, when it comes up. Uh, that's that's my, my first takeaway. My, my second key takeaway is that retirement issue we talked about. Uh, will we even, will the word retirement even be part of our vocabulary when we're talking about careers in the future? Uh, will it be semi-retirement or retirement till death? Uh, but I don't, it, it will not be viewed by the next generation of leaders like it has been viewed and we have been accustomed to for our generation. There's, that's for sure. That's my key takeaway. Craig, your key takeaway. My key takeaway, I believe, is something what you talked about, Pete, is just this whole idea around employee engagement. But what are we doing to engage with our employees at the same time to help make their lives better and invest them completely? And I think that's, boy, it's, it's entirely possible. I steal that idea for a blog post somewhere down the line. And if I do, at least in my heart, I will credit you with the idea. Uh, <laughs> so that is my key takeaway today. Pete, how about you? Do you have a key takeaway today? Yeah, you know, it's something Lou was talking about. Oftentimes around here, we talk about where, you know, someone's financial problems may not be your fault as their employer, but it, but it is your problem. Like it is going to affect you. Lou was talking about, you know, the, the, the she session, this idea that, um, you know, it may not be my fault as an employer that the recession has affected women more than men. But it's certainly my problem, and it's our, our culture's problem, it's our community's problem, and I think to acknowledge that and seeing how you can be a bigger part of the solution is an important thing, so that way it doesn't turn into like, a, uh, well, you know, it's not my problem, which is really easy to do as an employer sometimes based on sort of the dynamics of your, your, work, your workforce. Awesome. Well, Pete, thanks so much for being on Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. Uh, we enjoyed the conversation, and... Uh, Maybe down the road, we can find out how 22 actually played out. We'll revisit with you in early 2023. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Yes, I was, <laughs> I was so enamored. I was like, that was like a Hallmark card. I just wanted to sit and read it again. Uh -huh. Keep it classy here, Pete. That yeah. was so good. I, like, I'm going to replay that personally in my personal life. <laughs> thank you, Pete. We enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks, Chance. Okay, Craig. Well, that was great talking to Pete and uh, the intimidation fear factor that I had going into it definitely paid off. I mean, he's talking to us from a studio. Uh, you're in your office. I'm in my office. It's a studio. Yeah, yeah. We call it a studio, but he's got all of the, you know, the acoustic uh, wall stuff and you, you could tell he's a professional. Uh, but I, I did enjoy his conversation. I enjoyed our conversation talking about uh, the financial stress that people have and how it affects uh, their, their work habits and things going on. And I particularly was um, I, 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 I intrigued, I think is the word that I use when it comes to retirement. And will that be a word that we use in the future? So I, that, that was really intriguing for me. Well, I think it was really just to really understand how these struggles and especially what he was telling us about kind of the financial tsunami hitting in 2022 yeah. as student loans going to repayment, some of the credits are going away and all those things. And really thinking about what does that mean for your employees when people are getting a little crazy over the next couple of months starting in May. So uh, yeah. I hope everybody really paid attention, sharpened their pencils and took some good notes. Yeah, he didn't use the word tsunami, but <laughs> my word, tsunami. For okay. the record, Craig said. <laughs> tsunami. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed our interview with Peter Dunn and Pete the Planner when we talked about the creative ways in order to engage employees uh, that are dealing with uh, some financial difficulties. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this episode, please share us, rate us, review us. We are available on most of your social media platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And we also have our website, Q&A 
qualityleadership.com, where you can go on and you can look at our previous episodes of Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. In addition to that, we are available on all of your major podcast platforms. So until next time, be the best leader you can be. I'm Lou Quinto. And I'm Craig Anderson.